I'd like to call up our speakers uh, to sit up here on stage. Uh, we'll open it up for a question and answer period for about a half hour before uh, uh, Dr. Colin McEwen will give us uh, some uh, concluding remarks. Yeah, there While they're doing that, I had the opportunity to walk a stretch of the Antisuyu Road a few years ago with a llama caravan, and I can testify that the road is alive. When they say it's a sacred road, it means that the road has consciousness. The road uh, speaks to the traveler. So when the people walk on the road, they're walking, the, they say the road is taking us. The road takes us to the next place. And they're always in connection to the high mountain deities, the Apus, the Pachamama, the wind, the use of the coca leaf as a sacrament. It's a constant reminder of, uh, of that old uh, indigenous way of, uh, of world alive, what uh, some people have called animism, but it's really more, uh, it's a deeper spiritual principle than that. If there are questions from the audience, I believe there's a microphone being set up here. And um, the speakers have their microphones. Uh, so we're looking for a question. Please use the microphone at the back of the room. That way it's recorded. We have a, we have a question. An Inca road, the stones are very stable. Did you have a chance to build yourself a little piece of the road to understand how the Incas built it? I, we weren't allowed to really touch anything. Mm -hmm. um, so, one, but they are very stable. Um, one of the things that we also did notice is that most of them were worked in a way that uh, that we could. Um, move over them very easily and they shed water very easily um, but we didn't get to, to take any of the stones. And the ground penetration radar didn't reveal any secrets? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> we were hoping that we would find something like the Roman roads. Um, that's what, sort of what we were expecting. And so with the ground penetrating radar, it really showed us that the paving, the paved areas were only about eight inches deep, um, and, and that was it. We were expecting something with using the ground penetrating radar behind the retaining walls. We were expecting to find something um, like Ken and Ruth had found on the agricultural terraces, but it was, it was not there. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, um, I want to thank all of you for the fascinating presentations today. I'm curious about um, the situation, the social, social, cultural, economic situation of the communities along the road. Now, I, I presume there's a whole range of ones if there's 3,500 miles. Uh, but just give us an idea of um, what, what the situation is there and what you see the prospects of the, um, of the, um, the, the, the communities are in, in the future. And in fact, if the exhibit has some a way of uh, linking uh, the um, development, let's say, of the communities in, in a generic sense, I don't know what development would mean, uh, but uh, what, what sh I'd like to know more about the communities and um, what your feeling is about the future of them. Thank you. You saw the picture. Uh, we're eating the sopa, papa, de papas the potato, that was breakfast and that was supper every day. We did get cooey one day for lunch. That was like being fed your Thanksgiving dinner though. I mean, it was a special deal. We lived in the communities. Uh, we slept on the floor of the local schools. We, we took sleeping bags and mats. Uh, where we were away from Cusco in, in the middle part of Peru, it's isolated. 
there are copper mines and gold mines and you find that influx of money when you get close to those facilities. Uh, you found alcohol is a problem like you have in some Indian reservations here. Uh, that influx of money and everything. But the road from the communities further away is still a, a vital artery. They take their potatoes, they load them up, and now they have horses which can carry more than a, a Yama can only carry about 40 pounds. Uh, and they take it to market. The, the, he had the picture there. You saw the, the woman's walking in front and the guy's sitting on the horse and, and usually the bag of potatoes hanging on the horse also. That schoolhouse is one teacher for everybody, all the children in the community. Uh, there's usually uh, one latrine or baño in the community, or maybe two. Now, we're talking about the small villages along the road where we stay. The government of Purdue, uh, Purdue Peru, <laughs> excuse me, uh, has got a program they just instituted about a year and a half ago they are trying to identify bright students in those schools. And I know about this because I, I teach at Universidad de Pura. We have about 100 of them now. They take them out of that community. They give them a, a full ride in the university. We have, they've never had money. We have to teach them how to use money. We have to teach them how to go to the store and buy things. They're used to living in their, their little communities. Uh, they're going to pay for their education, they're going to pay for their books, they're going to give them a sh small allowance. Uh, at the university, we're going to help them learn how to work in a metropolitan environment instead of that, that small environment. Uh, I took one of these students to Medellin, Colombia in August and I almost cried listening to her tell me the story or telling everybody in that audience the story of what this has meant to her and the opportunity she's going to have. That program even will take them to graduate school outside of the country if they want to afterwards. Maybe somebody else can add from their experience. If I may, uh, uh, Cliff, um, uh, uh, Ramiro Matos showed us a couple of photographs of the Pisa Community Museum. He was comparing some of the uh, present day uh, uh, building techniques that were still in use. Um, that's a museum that our institution here helped to uh, get started and promote over time. It, it services 12 different uh, agricultural communities in the valleys around uh, PISAC, uh, which is near Cusco. Cusco is experiencing a huge uh, tourism boom, uh, over a million people a year uh, in the area. Uh, this this uh, Funding, the money that comes in from the tourism largely stays in the uh, large cities and the large hotels. So there's a movement afoot to how to bring that uh, new economy, which is the interest, the cultural interest and the tourism, uh, to the community basis. That's, that's one level. Uh, many of the community bases are still largely self-sufficient, in, 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 at least in their food, uh, their food sovereignty, as it's called. Uh, 80, 90 percent uh, of their food is either bartered or uh, uh, produced uh, uh, um, their own uh, product and then bartering for uh, other products that are produced at a d different uh, level of, uh, of altitude. It's a vertical world, uh, the Andes. So uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of, uh, of the contention these days is, again, how to open up to modernity without losing the base of culture and the freedom that comes from that kind of food self-sufficiency, clothing self-sufficiency, housing self-sufficiency. Uh, they know how to do all these things. So there's a, in the midst of something that looks like poverty, if the culture is strong, there's a sense of well-being. If the culture is diminishing, then it's uh, more of a sense of impoverishment. Question, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for sharing your work with us. Uh, I'm a member of the public who's shown up today. So I'm not an engineer and I'm not a scholar in uh, Incan civilization. Uh, so trying to understand your work is interesting and, and thank you to the Smithsonian because it'll, I'll be curious to see how you translate this in, you know, in small doses that we can understand when it be, becomes an exhibit. Uh, and I have an engineering question. 
want to see, Dr. Fury, you were talking a little bit about putting steps into the roadway to break down the water and to break down the energy and slow it down. And then earlier, let's get the names right, um, Dr. Well, the guy from MIT, I can't find his name, uh, showed us how the river was straightened out in a particular place, so there would be more agricultural land. And, and I, I'm hearing a conflict, but maybe it's not there, because I'm remembering that I think I learned years ago that there was a lot of criticism of the United States Army Corps of Engineers for straightening out some of the major rivers in the United States, because it caused all kinds of problems later. So is it a good thing to straighten out a river, or is it a bad thing, or is sometimes is it a good thing, and sometimes is it a bad thing? So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn little baby bits of engineering. So which is one of the reasons I, I, I showed up. So, so are these good or bad things, or you know, sort of what can we learn? Thanks. Well, I'm gonna sound a little bit like a lawyer here instead of an engineer, but I'm gonna say, it depends. Um, and in looking at that area around PSAC where they straightened out river, the idea was for more agriculture, um, more opportunity for the land to grow food. Um, so, I would say in that situation, a, it, it was following along with the, the idea of actually growing more food. So I would say that it was a good idea in that situation. Was, but did they do that in the United States to get more agricultural land too, or was it for energy or transportation, or I don't know? We have built levees. I'm from the Corps of Engineers. We have built levees uh, to protect farmland. And when we get too much water, uh, we have spillways in Louisiana. We have the Morganza. We have another one just above New Orleans. Uh, because people today run cattle in there because we don't flow water through there too much, uh, when we have to open those things up to protect the city and, and to protect people downstream, uh, there's a lot of resistance. If you remember about two years ago, we had to blow a levee up in Illinois, I believe it was, just uh, around Cairo, uh, through a spillway system. But because people had built in that area, uh, it destroyed their homes and, and they had to move their cattle out. And the, the, the difference, I think, with the Inca, they have paid more attention to the energy. And, and we tried to talk about energy today. That, that's the impressive thing. When we and I'm going to go back into the 1800s. We're trying to keep the Port of New Orleans open. And we kept going there and trying to force a mechanical solution by dredging the river. Finally, a guy named Eads, who had built Eads Bridge. If you go to St. Louis, you can still see it. It's the arch bridge there. He went down there and said, why don't we use the energy of the water? And he effectively built uh, some piling with some boards on it and some reeds. So I took that energy of the water and I forced it to one place. And just like you were talking about your Venturi, that water runs out so you can fill that water jug. Now I use the energy of the river itself to keep the river clean so I have a channel so I can, the ships can get to the Port of New Orleans. They learned this, I believe, from the agriculture port, but they must have just spent hours sitting there and paying attention to the forces of nature and the power and how to work with it. They would change the landscape, like you said, that canal, but they understood those forces and how to work with them. I worked some with the Panama Canal. The French failed because they thought it was a question of digging a ditch. They forgot about the power of the water and what do I do with the water. The Americans go down there the first time when we take over and we think we're we're the great Americans. We know everything. And we failed too. And the first engineer we sat down there, after one year, he came home. He gave up. And we sent a guy named John Stevens, who had been a railroad engineer in Canada and in this country. And the first thing John Stevens did is he shut it down. And he said, let's take care of the people. We talked about the people system here. And we take care of the medical thing. And the next thing he did is he walked it. He walked it in the rain, he walked it in the flood, and he saw the power of the water. And he said, it's not a question of digging a ditch. It's a question of what I do with this water and how I control it. I can build this dam, and I can use the water to work the locks, 
It also reduces the ditch I have to dig and do this. The Inca always did that. They always paid attention to the energy of nature. Well, I'm not an engineer, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and I practice uh, uh, in drainage law and flood control. And I agree with the gentleman who talked about the problems with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, the whole attitude was keeping the water away from the people. And then along came Dr. Gilbert White and said, no, let's keep the people away from the water. And he was the inventor of uh, uh, the flood insurance program. The problem with building the levees is you build them to a specific uh, uh, amount of water that's going to come down. And then more of it comes down. And it spills over the levees. People build behind the levees. You could have the levees. If you wouldn't if you keep the rest of it open until you get to really some high ground, it would be okay, but they didn't do that. And over and over again, we have these floods. And, oh, surprise, act of God. No, act of man. We just need to know what we're really doing and keep the floodplains open. Well, I need to close up on that question. Let me say this. The uh, the Sacred Valley is a marvel of Inca ingenuity, and they happen to have straightened the river. It's a, one of the few instances in all of Inca empire where they channeled the river and straightened it out. The marvelous thing is that it's still, it's still channeled. It shows how well uh, they built it, and when you see the stone walls along the bank of the river, you can't help but marvel at the engineering that went into it. And the idea of if they went ahead and channeled all of the rivers in Peru, it would have been a disaster. Uh, but uh, as it was in the Sacred Valley, it was a, a masterpiece of engineering and innovativeness, and it's a beauty to behold. There was. Hello? Yes, yeah. okay. Well, uh, something that we have been uh, working in the case, specific case of Cusco is that uh, the Inca people try to keep uh, the balance between the water that was uh, coming inside the valley through rain or through the different uh, um, rivers and the, uh, the drainage or the evacuation of this water. That, uh, for, for, for doing that, in order to do that, it is necessary to uh, an integral a management of the water of the valley. Uh, the purpose of this um, manage of the water was the protection uh, of the new soil that was um, trying to, imp to uh, producing some way to, to, the, to the fields, to the crops. Uh, and we found that this is uh, the most important part is they never break the equilibrium uh, in the whole system because Bali, the, uh, the Watanai River is just one part of the Bali of Cusco that has three basins and they never break this um, equilibrium uh, in the drainage and the evacuation of water, and the, in the moment they move the the river uh, to the south slope of the of the valley. And, and finally, they never change the they never change the position of the Watanai because they create the Watanai, and that is something very important to understand. That's the atypical position of uh, Watanai now is the result of the creation of this channel in the south side of the valley to avoid does the rainwater uh, fill the lago, the humedal, in the basin and to drain and allow to create new agricultural uh, There were pre-Inca civilizations in Peru, typically along the rivers if you go to the desert towards the ocean. And they tried to channel rivers to get more agricultural land in the desert because all you needed was a little water. They didn't seem to pay attention to nature the same way though. And most of those things failed because of the earthquakes and the movement of the land. 
the grade wouldn't allow the water to flow anymore. And all this work, all this labor they did was wasted. Uh, the Inca had this unique holistic approach that it considered what was going on in nature. That, uh, we do a good job in the university teaching math and physics and all the good engineering things. We don't do a good job of teaching this holistic paying attention. And that's why I think this exhibit, if we can get it together, is going to be very important. Take a couple of more questions. Hi. I guess we'll, um, this we'll, may be a we'll bit cluster of a, off on this three. Okay. Go ahead. Cool. This may be a bit of a tall order, but I was hoping each of you could discuss maybe one idea or engineering principle that we today could adopt from the Inca and apply in response to modern engineering and environmental challenges. Possible? Yeah. I didn't quite hear the question. <laughs> Well, for, for one thing, we could, uh, as has been said over and over again, especially by Cliff, we could, for example, see where the water really goes instead of uh, so, much of our, so much of our engineering, our construction, and so forth. We build a building first, and then we say, oh, we've got to do something about the drainage around the building or through the building. At Machu Picchu, with 80 inches of rainfall a year, they took care of the drainage. Uh, there's a wall there, it has a hole in it, and you say, what is that hole for? Well, up to the hole, about 12 feet high, is a retaining wall. From above that, it's drainage from the buildings that are behind the wall. They built that into the wall when they built the structure to begin with. If we would watch and see what water does in particular, from the beginning, we wouldn't have some of the flooding and the drainage problems that we have today. I I, I want to to add, uh, add. add uh, sorry. <laughs> I want to add something. I, idea for for us uh, that we come from uh, the other side of the Atlantic, and it's important to remark that our culture is constructed with a Europos, Europocentric uh, concept, a general Europocentric concept that uh, say, that usually say that only the culture, the sophisticated cultures can't, uh, it's not possible for the sophisticated cultures to find a balance with nature, a balance with a sustainable development. And I think that the, not only the Incas, but the Andean culture and the American culture about the relationship between settlements and nature is the proof that is, that is not uh, right. Uh, very, very sophisticated cultures like the Inca cultures can construct, transform the nature, but in, in one balance, a sustainable balance of this transformation. And that is something that we have to learn from the past. It's not possible for the general uh, culture in the world have to learn for the a specific experience in the past where this balance was constructed with a very, very sophisticated culture. And it's something, it's a lesson that, that we have to learn and our responsibility is for our studies as to show for the general public that this is an important way for the future of our planet. And not is, and that is obviously something difficult to show in an exhibition, is to create, uh, to create uh, didactic tools to show for the general public that we are not only speaking about objects from a, a lost culture, uh, or contrary, no? we are working in the present, but. Uh, looking in the past and thinking in our future. And that is, I think, our challenge as scholars uh, working in this so important and sophisticated culture. Well, there question? are many lessons we learn. Uh, uh, many of us are studying uh, mm -hmm. what the Inca did and how they did it, and what we le uh, take away and bring back to the U.S. here in our practices and teaching is the 
a high standard of care that they utilized all those years ago uh, before Columbus sailed. Uh, a high standard of care for uh, creating uh, buildings, public works uh, for posterity, for long term. And I think some of the, the well, the road network is a good example itself. Um, it wasn't a matter of building for 40 years or for 20 or the length of a mortgage payment. It was building forever, and uh, there was a certain payoff. Economically, it may not uh, work out when we start looking at present worth uh, statistics and economics, but it's a, tr it's a pleasure to see uh, an ancient civilization build for longevity. So we had a high standard of care, and then we noticed I, uh, maybe most of all, soil stewardship. They took care of the soil and they prevented landslides. And you've seen pictures of Machu Picchu and many of you have been there. But at Machu Picchu, there wouldn't be a Machu Picchu for us to look at if it had not been for the good foundations they built, the tender loving care for uh, uh, handling the steep slopes and uh, just old fashioned soil stewardship. So. There's many lessons that can be learned from studying the Inca, and we bring those back to the U.S., and it helps us uh, prosper and benefit here in the United States. Uh, yes, thank you so much for organizing this. I, I have to come back a little bit. Maybe I, I can help to explain about these, uh, uh, the rivers, how they are good or not in the sense of uh, straightening the rivers. In the continental U.S., I mean, most of the river has been straightened because of uh, conveyance to transport more water. So basically, you have levees and you have, you basically interrupted when you have flooding, there is a richness of nutrients that are being uh, delivered to the flat plain. That's what also is good for agricultural purposes. But these rivers are, this, this, let's, let's say the sediments are very small and they are low gradient, very small slopes of the rivers. So the rivers tend to be more sinuous. However, in the case of the Sacred Valley, the rivers are higher, uh, they have higher uh, bed slope. So basically they are more confined into the valley. So they don't have enough room to move as the rivers like the Mississippi used to be, for example. So in that case, straightening the river is not, you know, deviating too much from its natural uh, configuration. So that's why maybe the effects in the, in the in the in the in the rivers that you are showing, it's not you know it's not it's, it's still preserved until now. But that wouldn't be the case if the Incas did a straightening of, for example, the Ucayali River in the jungle, in the Peruvian jungle. That would be a different story. So that may help a little bit to explain. But my question was uh, for Dr. Uh, Fiori. Uh, you show very nice, uh, you know, the idea of the dissipation of energy of water dissipation. And with these steps, have you, uh, you know, we are engineers, have you calculated basically if that was an efficient design? You know, basically you can do maybe based on the precipitation, calculate the runoff, and if that spacing of these steps is the kind of the more efficient or not? So that I will be very interesting, on, you know, putting some numbers to those uh, energy dissipations, uh, because they were very clever in instead of having a long channel from the top of the hill to the bottom, they basically divide it, and each of these steps you will have a free fall. So they were very smart to just divide the channels in, in small channels. So I will be very interested in seeing some numbers on that. And I have another question uh, for maybe the uh, organizers of the uh, exhibition. I mean, we have seen a lot of about the roads, but how about uh, the services that the, that the Inca has also provided along the road. For example, I've, I've been in the, during the summer in Huaytara, Huancabelica, and they have a very, like a rest area, which they also design very nicely the location of this rest area. And uh, the, Incas, the Inca could go and take like a bath in the river, the Huaytara River, but it, it was nicely hydraulically designed. So there are other also services that the, maybe the road provided to the you know, people that were uh, uh, traveling there. So maybe that also could be considered uh, somehow. So. Thank you. 
We, we I'm, actually I'm, I'm, did I heard do more of a commentary than a question, but perhaps oh. you, you heard yeah. it. Okay. We're going to talk to you. Know, <laughs> okay. We actually did do, um, we haven't looked exactly at all the steps, but we did do a, a calculation looking at um, an area where we had channels across the road and where we had culverts. And what we looked at was the, the size of that drainage basin um, and the amount of flow that would come through that particular area based upon the um, average rainfall within that area, and we found that those stone culverts and the, the channel that went across the road were, were very accurately sized for the quantity of water that would flow. So we have, we have begun to look at those, those quantities. Final question. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, uh, my questions are going to be directed to uh, Jose and Ricardo because they may have some answers. First of all, I'd like to say that there's been a great deal of over-attribution to the Incas of technologies that took nearly 3,000 years of Andean working on them to develop. Uh, we had roads, we had terraces, irrigation, 3,000 years before the Incas appeared. And the Incas may have learned in other regions how to do the things that they did. Now, except the rights, because they are working on sites that we know were built actually by the Incas. But when we get to Cusco, there were people in Cusco before the Incas arrived. Even the Incas say that themselves. And so it was, and I know that you probably aren't digging and finding whether there's any ceramics in the terraces to know whether they really are Inca. But I'm wondering if just from the pure logic of when what was built and whether things corrected other things that were built in terms of the development of the, of the uh, canalization of the waters like under the Tuyumayu and you know the Sapi and all that, whether you can develop a kind of a sequence of what had to happen first, second, third, fourth so that we have an idea that perhaps is even datable as to how uh, Cusco as an irrigated terrace complex developed. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, we think that, uh, of course, before Inca people arrived to Cusco Valley, uh, there were different groups living there. Mm -hmm. uh, little by little, Incas, arrived to what we know now as the ceremonial center. Mm -hmm. And the chronicle says that, for instance, in the Aucaipara Plaza or Square, that is now the Plaza de Armas of Cusco, uh, they suffer a lot of um, problems with water. That was a wetland that they have to drain a lot, that they have before all those things with the Incas before Pachacutic. Before so, Pachacutic. Before Pachacutic. So this is why we stay or we, we, we say that it's from Pachacutic or with the Pachacutic uh, intervention that everything changes. That's and we true. say that everything changes because it's not possible to dry the wet land, the wet, uh, land without channel the rivers or without manage the springs that uh, fit that uh, wetland at the center of the, of, the, of the ceremonial center. And this is just one case that we can amplify to the whole basin of the Watanai River because they have to correct the, uh, all the courses of the rivers that come from the come from top of the mountain and goes to feed the, the big lagoon in the in the base of the of the valley. So this is why we say this is a this is an intervention done by Pachacutic on the time of Pachacutic and as a big uh, planning intervention. I hope I have understood. Well, I was wondering if you can actually. Uh, sequence which uh, canalizations and terraces had to be built prior for the next thing to happen. Can well, you sequence that? Well, uh, the, 
it's very it's not easy sometimes to to to, to say what could be that that sequence but is uh, first we think they have to channel they have to but in some cases to 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 make those channels they have to build terraces to uh, keep the land in uh, to contain the land uh, that goes to those uh, canyons formed by the by the rivers uh, and the Watanai River and, and Tuyumayo River are good examples because we have the channel and then we have the construction of terraces that forms platforms where they build the the compounds of, of the of the city. Yeah, um, I'm ampliando um, the explanation of Alejandro. We have to understand that the archaeological data allow us to construct a logic process mm -hmm. in, the in the construction of the system. Then we don't have any material archaeological proof the, to, to speak about the relationship between canals, uh, terraces, and streets. But we know that it's impossible. The, the terraces are uh, constructed in the relationship which are parallel to the canals. That means that the first element must be the water system, because if you have no control in the water system, you can build anything. Then that's significant. That means that means that we have three steps, successive steps in the design process of the whole system. First, the water system, then the terraces to give a geometrical mod model uh, shape to the terrain, and then the streets in the relationship with the terraces, mm -hmm. and finally the construction inside the buildings. Of course, this system uh, for the structural function of in must be planned in the same time. Because if you made a canal, you, you have to lose the solution for the evacuation of the water. You can, can do a half of canal. The only, of course, that is in a little, small, a little contradiction with the oral tradition for the Inca Panacas uh, written by the chronicles. And we have different. Uh, different informations about the Inca Roca, for example, in the relationship with the water, the water management in the Aucaipata, and we have the information from Garcilaso de la Vega for other uh, works, for other Incas. Mm -hmm. But finally, uh, we have to think that the whole system was, uh, in, in an architectural point of view, so linked that the, the only interpretation possible is to integrate everything in a in a in a general system. I don't I don't know if I. I think. Uh, I I think, think the, um, I think last the, remarks then. From, I think uh, the question Ruth. also relates to why the Inca are getting credit for all of this, because the Inca Empire really, from Pachacuti on, only lasted a hundred years, and you wonder how they did it all. Well, just like every other culture built on the cultures beforehand, yes, there were terraces, many, many terraces, hundreds of years before the Inca. Yes, there were water canals. The huge Wari Empire had water that went hundreds of miles uh, uh, in, in canals. And so uh, the Inca built on all of this. But the, the genius of the Inca is that they were able to produce food for the empire. Just like the Egyptians, they produced food and then they, had, they liberated three-fourths of their population or more to do other things, to have an army, to have priesthoods, to, uh, to build beautiful buildings, to um, uh, create things out of gold. And, but they learned some of this from the previous cultures. The Mochi did the wonderful pottery. They pulled it all together and they had the empire larger than the one uh, of Alexander the Great. And they managed this with quipus and uh, chaskis running from one stage to another for information. They had this incredible organizational ability to do all of this. 
and they were also the last ones standing. Because after that, the Spaniards came and the indigenous populations no longer had an empire. I think there's a part that we didn't talk about today, and it's the Cocos. And we talked about the rains, we talked about the droughts. If you go to the west coast of South America, you have a desert down there, the Alcom, down in the northern part of Chile. It's the driest place in the world. Maybe every 70 years they see a little rain. If you go up in northern Peru, in the Seixuran Desert, it's almost as bad. You had these civilizations that did good things, probably the terraces like we talked about. The Inca had the coca. The Inca understood that this year it might not rain. And I have to have food to keep this empire going. They studied the temperatures of where I place it on a mountain. And just like we build runways for airplanes with the typical winds, they placed those co cocos. These are round or they're square buildings depending on what I'm putting in. Whether I'm putting in crops like potatoes or I'm putting in the grain crops. I put it in the mountain on the right elevation. I turn it the right way on the side of the mountain. So I got to pick a mountain so the wind's blowing. And I put the big windows there. And now if I get a drought and I lose a crop a year, and that happens, I can still feed my population. I can keep this civilization going. The previous ones, I have not seen any evidence that they did anything like that about storing. So without electricity, they had their own refrigerators, which allowed that civilization to keep going and do all this work that we've talked about, building this road and building Cusco and all the rest of it. I'm going to close out the discussion there. We have one final speaker. Please uh, stay in your seats. And while the uh, speakers group goes back to the audience, uh, we'll introduce our next speaker. <laughs>